Uh, just a little bit about myself. I graduated from FAMU Law School here in 2012, and I'm an attorney in Winter Park. Most of my practice is personal injury, but I dabble in agricultural law, uh, working with the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund and some other random projects as they come along. Our first speaker is Megan Herzog, who's joined us all the way from California. Uh, Megan researches law and policy responses to climate change and other environmental issues for UCLA's Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Her ongoing projects include, include supporting local governments and climate change adaptation and st sustainability, advancing national climate policy, and mitigating marine pollution. She also teaches ocean and coastal law and policy and climate law and policy and works closely with UCLA's Environmental Law Clinic. She has published on a range of environmental law topics, including climate adaptation, human rights, and greenhouse gas regulation. She received her JD and MS in Environment and Resources from Stanford University. Prior to joining the UCL, UCLA faculty, she was a fellow at the Environmental Law Institute in Washington, D.C. And Megan's uh, presentation will be going over the clear risk the right to food at all levels of climate change response. Uh, her presentation will provide an overview of what the right to food means, legal protections of the right to food, and how climate change is projected to impact food systems and the right to food. Her presentation will then de delve into potential interactions between the right to food and particular responses to climate change, including, including climate-regulated migration and conflict, proactive adaptation planning and disaster planning, and mechanisms to facilitate transfers of financial and technical assistance for climate response. The presentation will close with several ways that advocates can help promote the right to food in the context of a changing climate. Megan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that great introduction, Andrew. I'm so delighted to be here. So I'm going to talk about um, topics that are related to agricultural and food justice, but in a slightly different angle than people have been talking about at the conference so far. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the right to food. And we've been talking a lot about the local scale and the national scale, and I'm going to be speaking more about the global scale. And thinking about impacts to food systems across all scales, climate change is a really important influencer. So thinking about the future of where law is headed in all of these areas that touch on food and agriculture, climate change is really important. Um, and so as Andrew mentioned, I work at the Emmett Institute at UCLA, and we are a policy shop for the most part. It's a bunch of lawyers, and we provide tools to decision makers at all levels of government to help think about how to deal with really tricky problems like climate change and other environmental problems. And so just so I know, how many people here are uh, law students? And how about lawyers? Is everyone else an actual lawyer? Okay. And so there's some non-lawyers here as well. Great. Okay. And future law students? Excellent. Welcome. Okay, great. So I'll try and speak in a way that's really accessible to everyone. So even people who don't know anything about law or about international law, but I hope you'll ask me questions or raise your hand if you if there's something I say that's not clear. Okay, great. So first, what's the right to food? So the right to food is generally understood as a right for all people to access adequate, nutritious food and to be free from malnutrition and hunger. And so human rights, the concept of human rights is that these are rights that are inherent to us because we are born into the human community. So they're not given to us by, by any particular legal instrument. These are rights that we have. And they're protected under a variety of international treaties and documents. When we're thinking about the right to food, probably the most important is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which I've listed here. But the right to food is also in the UN Declaration on Human Rights and some other instruments that are really important. And generally, uh, an international treaty only applies to the states that have ratified that treaty in a legal sense. So if you've signed and then you've taken national action in your country, to further the right to food, then there's a legal enforceable right in your country. So importantly, the United States has not ratified this particular convention, the ICESCR, although the United States is, um, in general, under the Obama administration, a, a proponent of the concept of the right to food. In general, there's 
opposition, as we all know here at a philosophical level, to thinking about socio and economic rights as legally enforceable rights. And so, uh, nonetheless, the United States is still the world's largest provider of food aid, and so we have a, a major role to play in thinking about the right to food. But many countries around the world have ratified this treaty, and there are also a number of countries that have the right to food embodied in their national constitutions or in domestic law in their state. And so what does it mean, actually, when we're thinking about adequate food? It's sort of an abstract concept. So the international body that implements this particular treaty has issued some guidance to help think about what it really means, the right to adequate food. And so one thing is that it must be acceptable to consumers culturally and in terms of its quality. It must be available in adequate quantities and sufficient to provide the nutrition that you need to live a healthy life and do all of the human activities that we do. It must be economically and physically accessible. So I should be able to go out and get that food without endangering my life or my safety. It should be possible for me to get there. And I should also be able to purchase it at a price that um, you know, is economically accessible for me. And then finally, the food must be produced in a sustainable way. So this is part of how the right to food connects back to the sustainable food systems that we've been talking about in this conference earlier. And in all human rights, in, in, the, in the context of all human rights, states are generally understood to have the duties to respect and protect and fulfill those rights. So states themselves shouldn't be interfering in people's ability to access food. States should also be protecting people from the conduct of third parties, so corporations or other actors that might interfere with the right to food. And states should also be fulfilling the right to food, so taking positive actions to create conditions that will enable people to realize their rights. And underlying this is a, is a principle that's understood in international human rights law as progressive realization. So we understand that states have different capacities and they have different levels of socioeconomic development and so it's not necessarily the case that in every circumstance the right to food will be completely fulfilled for every person at all times. And so we understand that states need to work to the best of their abilities and capacities and resources to be fulfilling this right. So progressing over time in allowing their citizens to realize this right. Okay, so that's the basic context for the right to food. And now how does climate change influence the right to food and food systems in general? So we can think about climate change as having impacts that fall into two buckets. We have primary impacts of climate change and the secondary impacts of climate change. So the primary impacts are the way that climate change itself will directly influence the food system, uh, typically in adverse ways that will hinder the right to food for many people. And so some of these are listed here. So climate change, can I say climate change in Florida? <laughs> it's related to, um, projected to reduce agricultural production. It's projected to result in more extreme weather events that can interfere with production and in bringing goods to market. There may be saltwater intrusion into agricultural lands, reduced soil fertility, losses of livestock, crop failures, um, and in changes in water availability. So things like drought, desertification, changes in snow melt that will affect agricultural production. And it's important to recognize that these primary impacts are going to be felt most severely in uh, people who are, whose lives and livelihoods are most closely tied to the land and to the water resources. So typically rural workers, small farm owners, and people who live in countries where they're already experiencing a lot of food insecurity and a lot of economic insecurity. So climate change is going to magnify the impacts that those people already feel. And secondary impacts describes the way that all of the things that we do in response to climate change might influence the food system and the right to food. So we have mitigation. So that is a, in the word in climate law, that word describes everything we try to do to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to the problem of climate change. And about a third of our emissions in general come from the agricultural sector. So there's a lot of actions we might be taking to reduce agriculture related emissions that will have ramifications throughout the food system and to the right to food. So you could think about things like growing biofuels trying to engage in forestry projects which compete with land or change the way that people are using land in forested areas or ways to change the technology and the um, vehicles and all the other uh, transportation related infrastructure that's related to the food system. 
And adaptation describes all the changes that we make in anticipation of or in response to adverse climate change impacts. So things that we would do as a community to reduce our vulnerability to um, all of the things that are happening on this side, right? There's a lot of things we want to do to prepare for that. And those can have impacts on the food system too. So for example, in response to drought or in response to crop failure, we might want to alter production techniques or alter irrigation techniques, change seeds and crop varieties, might want to seek out different kinds of insurance systems, or have protections for these storms and these disasters. We might migrate. People might be forced to leave one area to another area. And all of these actions as well can impact the right to food and the food system. And I'm going to talk about a few of those in detail. And we could talk about more in the discussion if you'd like also. So let's think about the mitigation bucket first. It seems like if all of the greenhouse gas emissions that we're emitting are impacting the food sector so severely, as I mentioned, then doesn't realizing and fulfilling the right to food mean that people who are contributing to climate change have an obligation and responsibility to reduce those emissions and to stop all the climate impacts. So you could think that maybe states might be obligated to adopt measures to control their emissions, maybe to transfer technology or funding uh, to all the people who are feeling the impacts of climate change most severely to provide humanitarian aid. So far, in a legal sense, no petitioner has succeeded with this sort of claim, making a claim that people who are emitting greenhouse gases are obligated to reduce their emissions because they are impacting international human rights, including the right to food. Um, and in general, it's still pretty unclear what emitters' legal obligations are in the context of the international human rights regime. In general, extraterritorial obligations are a challenge in the international human rights regime. So thinking about what obligation actors in one state have to the global community. But as I put this up here as a, as a background because I think it's really important because even just taking human rights as um, a lens for advocacy or for legal action or for grassroots campaigning can be really important and effective. So a rights-based approach, even if in a legal sense it may not be successful, can be really helpful for advocacy. And so despite all those clear connections between climate change and the right to food, we know there's very few linkages between um, the actual climate change regimes and um, the international human rights regimes. And I'm going to dig now into one of the ways that right to food and climate change interact uh, that will be most particularly severely felt around the world. And that's in terms of climate-related migration and conflict. So migration in general, worldwide, may be one of the most significant consequences of climate change. And it has really significant implications for the right to food. And so I've laid out the four basic scenarios here um, for the ways that climate change could result in human displacement and migration. So there's acute disasters, like a big storm event, for example. There's gradual deterioration, like desertification or drought. There's increased risk of those things, which might cause people to want to leave in advance. Or there's general climate-related social disorder. So, um, conflict over resources or all of these other events and aftermaths of storm events and things like that that can exacerbate underlying violence or conflict or even lead itself to violence and conflict. So all of these um, scenarios can have themselves disruptions into the food system, into the production and the transportation and the preparation and the consumption of food. So that, of course, hinders the right to food can also themselves lead to migration and displacement or themselves lead to violence and conflict, which can in turn disrupt the food system. So you can see how when we have these sort of events, um, they, they impact populations in ways that have really deep, significant ties to the food system. And unfortunately, international law is not really prepared for the kind of migration scenarios that might result from climate change. So we have a convention that relates to refugees. And that convention was adopted in the 50s and the 60s, and it was really focused on a different type of migration problem. So people who were uh, who feared that being persecuted for reasons of race or nationality or membership in a particular social group or political opinion, 
none of that really applies to people who might be crossing international borders because of climate change or uh, environmental resource conflicts. So there are, we don't really have protections yet in international law for these type of migration scenarios. And we already have really serious um, stresses to our, to our systems we're dealing with refugees, but the climate change migrants um, could most severely outnumber the number of refugees that, that, um, it, that governments are currently dealing with around the world. So it's a pretty significant problem. One strategy that states can employ to reduce the risk of violations and reduce the risk of migration and help realize the right to food in a climate change scenario is to take proactive action in advance of climate change to think about how we're going to respond. And so adaptation planning and planning for disasters and hazards provides a really valuable opportunity for states both to hear from their citizens and the community about the ways that, they, that we should respond and also to communicate the risks of climate change and the risks to human rights like the right to food to citizens. So engaging in proactive planning is really important. And taking a rights-based approach to that adaptation planning is also really important. So one way that states can do that is to conduct social and economic vulnerability assessments. So think about all the ways that we could respond to climate change and then analyze how all of those actions could influence the groups that are already um, vulnerable from a socioeconomic perspective, people across different communities, think about how different actions would affect different communities, and engage those people in a participatory planning process. So engage all of the stakeholders. And doing this type of assessment can help states avoid maladaptation, which is a term that describes actions that we take in response to climate change that actually themselves have destructive consequences that can be even more severe sometimes than the impacts of climate change themselves. So you can think about, for example, in response to greater food insecurity, um, states could try to engage in more global trade of food or could apply more harmful chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides to their crops than they already are. And that perhaps those responses could have even more destructive social, economic, and environmental impacts than the impacts of climate change themselves. So proactive planning can help states avoid engaging in these maladaptive actions. And in all cases, procedural protections are really important, especially for the most vulnerable communities. So ensuring that people have a stay, that they're involved in the participatory decision-making process, that there's accountability and transparency and the opportunity to um, seek grievances with your government. Of course, the lack of information about how climate change will impact the food system and the lack of financial resources to respond are barriers to states acting effectively to respond and to realize human rights like the right to food. Um, so on some level, transfer of financial and technological resources can be really important. There are some mechanisms that already exist in the climate change regime to help states transfer resources to other states, like developing countries that uh, need assistance to adapt to climate change effectively. Um, but in general, as I said, the scope of extraterritorial legal obligations is largely unclear. It's, it's not really clear to what extent, for example, countries like the United States that have emitted historically uh, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to the problem of climate change, what exactly on a numeric level our obligation is to other countries that are dealing um, with the impacts themselves. But in international law, in the uh, convention that I mentioned earlier and also in other areas of international law, there's an enshrined principle that states have a responsibility to cooperate in providing disaster relief and humanitarian assistance and in times of emergency. So it's pretty clear that um, there are already mechanisms for states, at least in the most extreme circumstances, to transfer resources and support to other countries. But certainly there's a role for um, proactive transfer of resources to engage in adaptation planning as well. And I just wanted to close, uh, since there are so many right to food advocates here at this conference, with a few um, areas in where, where uh, advocates who think about these issues could be more effective in helping to realize the right to food in the context of climate change. So first, there's more that can be done to raise awareness about the way that climate change will impact the right to food and to research 
particular how climate change interacts with the food system. And there can also be increased interactions between the folks who are thinking about food and agriculture and food systems, and the folks like me who are focused a lot on climate change, and the folks who are thinking about human rights because there's a clear connection between those three areas and a need for further dialogue. For those of you who are lawyers or budding lawyers, there's a great need to help clarify what states and uh, third party actors' legal obligations are in this context to help realize the right to food. There's also a lot of work that can be done to enhance communities' uh, capacity to respond to climate change. So that can include everything from um, social and economic development to literacy and education initiatives to improving people's housing and their medical care. All of these things that relate to social and economic development also make communities more resilient to climate change and to, and to food secure, and more food secure. And finally, promoting sustainable food practices is itself a response to climate change. It helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions and can also make food systems more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen, Kristen king Javen. She is the Director of Communications and Development for Farm Share Inc., a nonprofit focused on food recovery and distribution to Florida families in need. Previously, she worked as in house counsel for American Tower Corporation, focusing on commercial real estate. During law school, Kristen clerked for the South Florida Water Management District, focusing on environmental enforcement matters. She is the author of a proposed reconciliation of stakeholder interest in the GE soybean industry and Roy and Rolf of Earth Jurisprudence Principles, which is forthcoming in the Florida A&M University Law Review. Co-author of The Value of South Florida Real Estate When A1A is Underwater, Sea Level Rise and Private Property Rights, which was published in Real Property Probate and Trust Law section of Florida Bar's Spring Action Line issue and co-author of a chapter on factory farming and what can animal law learn from environmental law, which our own Professor Abate is publishing in his forthcoming September 2015. Um, Kristen holds a JD from St. Thomas University School of Law with a certificate in environmental justice and is a candidate for an LLM in environmental law from Vermont Law School with a certificate in food and ag law. Um, just briefly, before Kristen gets up here, her presentation to today, uh, Factory Farming in the Age of Agricultural Exceptionalism. When you think of where your meat, eggs, and milk come from, you may picture the idyllic landscape you're associ you associate with farms featured in movies, on television, or the advertising used to sell you the very animal product that made you think of a farm in the first place. In reality, animal products like meat, eggs, and milk are actually coming from factory farms that have no resemblance to the image of a red barn, roaming cattle, and a quaint farmhouse often used to depict the family farm. Factory farms prevail in the U.S. despite the environmental, animal rights, and human health issues that arise from the unsanitary conditions of concentrated animal feeding operations. This presentation will review factory farming conditions the federal and state laws regulating factory farms and public health and provide examples of agricultural exceptionalism throughout. The presentation will have a specific focus on poultry as it is the top meat choice for U.S. consumers. The presentation will conclude with a discussion of food transparency and consumerism. Kristen. Um, so like Andrew kind of or suggested, um, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about factory farming. Um, when I talk about factory farming, I'm talking about the production of beef, poultry, and pork. Um, and we're talking about production on concentrated animal feeding operations. So, um, Sonia did a really great um, presentation yesterday for anyone who was there that really covered all of the environmental, um, public health, and um, animal rights issues that arise in the factory farming industry. So just to give a brief summary for anyone who didn't attend her presentation, um, there's a ton of animal rights issues. Um, animals are living in unsanitary and unnatural environments where they're not able to exhibit their natural behaviors. Um, the example you gave yesterday was pigs not being, or chewing at the bars of their cages. 
And a lot of that comes from pigs naturally want to be able to communicate and with, with other pigs and form relationships, and they just can't in the factory farming um, environment. Um, from an environmental perspective, agricultural waste um, runs off into our rivers. It affects adjacent neighborhoods. There's a lot of studies showing that there's cancer clusters forming around different agriculture um, areas. Um, and then from a public health perspective, unsanitary conditions and the antibiotics used to raise our meat supply and our eggs and our dairy is then being passed off onto consumers. Um, this, there's foodborne illness issues arising from there. There's increased exposure to antibiotics. All kinds of issues arising in the public health sector. So the question is, with all these issues coming up in factory farming, why do factory farms just thrive in the United States? So this really comes down to two things. First is agriculture exceptionalism, which I'm going to get into. And this is basically the idea that there's not adequate regulation of factory farms. The second is agricultural products, um, well, I should say animal products, are um, existing in a market that isn't truly representative of the, the, the actual cost um, of producing the product. So first, just to give a description of agricultural exceptionalism, that's the concept that um, agriculture gets a hall pass, basically. Agriculture gets a hall pass from federal regulations, state regulations, local regulations. Um, and if you think back historically to you know, the beginning of our country, the beginning of time, anything like that, it makes sense that you would not regulate the people that are producing the food. Food is nece necessary for all of us to live. You don't want to put a really heavy burden on um, the food producers. But in this day and age, the agriculture or the exceptions that apply to the agriculture industry are now being used by huge vertically integrated massive corporations to make billions and billions of dollars. So it's still in place. Actually, right now, the um, Florida legislature is considering yet another extension, or another exception, I should say, for Florida agriculture. So it's still existing today. There's still exceptions for agriculture everywhere you turn. And new laws are getting enacted all the time to still accept, or exempt agriculture from certain laws. So the, the um, I just want to go through some examples of the different types of exemptions um, to various laws that allow factory farming to thrive. So the first area I'm going to touch on is animal rights. So there's two federal laws that cover animal rights um, or seek to protect animal rights. So the first is the, is the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act is intended to make sure um, animals that go through slaughter do so in a humane fashion. So the idea is that before they are slaughtered, they are rendered insensible to pain. And that can be done by just a swift action that basically either freezes them or kills them. So a gunshot, uh, electric, all those types of things are approved as a way to render an animal immediately if that's to pain. The other method would be um, following different kosher standards or other religious practices. Um, so this animal, or so the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act has one huge gap that allows one specific area of the agriculture, or animal, sorry, the agriculture sector to, to thrive, and that's the poultry exception. So the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act does not apply to poultry, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because poultry is the number one, um, or the top meat eaten by, or chosen by U.S. consumers. So if you look through the legislative history of the poultry, or the Animal Welfare Act, um, and to, to see why poultry wasn't included. If you go through the legislative history, poultry and livestock were basically talked about in two different context. So they always treated them as different categories. When the law came out, they decided poultry was excluded. They only went with the livestock, um, or, or the livestock definition. So 
this law has been, or this exception for poultry has been challenged. Um, the USDA came out in 2005 with a Federal Register announcement saying, well, we don't need to include poultry in the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act because we have a Poultry Products Inspection Act that requires best practices. So because the Poultry Inspection Act requires best practices, they don't need to be covered on the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So this was challenged in a Ninth Circuit case, and the plaintiffs tried to compel the USDA to add poultry to the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. And their answer, they kind of dodged the subject, um, which happens a lot in environmental cases, and said, well, because the Humane Medicine Slaughter Act does not have, um, does not have a provision for redressability, um, and that's because redressability under humane, or it, it actually falls under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, we're not going to, there, there's no out, there's no redressability here. So, to this day, poultry is still an exemption from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So to me, this is really concerning because poultry is the largest meat, or the number one meat um, consumed in the United States. So I'm just gonna hand out. So, so yeah, so poultry is thriving in the United States. It's expected to grow, as Sonia said, and yet they are exempted from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So they get no protection. So it doesn't make any sense that the, um, you know, something that's produced so much takes little protection. So moving on, the next um, federal law that seeks to protect um, animal rights is the uh, Federal Animal Welfare Act. So the Federal Animal Welfare Act is um, an anti-cruelty statute that seeks to protect animals that are in commerce. Um, this includes pets, this is, includes animals that are um, in research facilities. So this law exempts all farm animals. So if you look at the legislative history of the Federal Animal Wel Welfare Act, there is a really great discussion um, in one of the committee meetings where it's two Texas representatives going at it and they're discussing why horses should be protected, um, um, but farm animals shouldn't. And the when they get to the end, they, they basically say, well, a horse is very different than a farm animal. And you think about it, it just doesn't make any sense. An animal is an animal. So why you would treat a horse so differently than other animals just doesn't make any sense. There is some hope. Um, there is a bill being considered in the, in the legislature right now um, that would extend farm animals very limited protection when they're a, in a government research facility. Um, that's still going through subcommittee at the moment, so we're not sure if that's going to actually make it through. Um, but that would be the first time that the Animal Welfare Act is actually applied to farm animals. So it's a start. But still, as you will see, agriculture gets passed throughout all of the animal welfare laws. Okay, so outside of animal rights, um, in the environmental and land use context, agriculture and factory farming also are exempted from most laws um, in some form or fashion or very limited um, in the regulation. So in the Clean Water Act, um, small, and just, just to give you a context, um, small, medium, large um, factory farms, are, it depends on the type of, um, whether it's uh, poultry, um, swine, or, or beef, or, and, or sorry, cow, or whether and what type. So like veal, or calf's raised for veal is different than a dairy cow, depending on the number that defines small, medium, large. So just to give a context, so we have a number to work with, um, a cow ca calf operation of 300 cows or less is considered small. So, which is still a lot, 300 cows is still a lot. And there's still a lot of waste produced from 300 cows. So 300 cows um, is exempted from the Clean Water Act. Um, a me some medium-sized CAFOs are also exempted. They have to qualify for certain other qualifications, but they're also exempted. And all agricultural run stormwater, or, or sorry, um, stormwater runoff from factory farms are also exempted under the Clean Water Act. I said um, 
stormwater runoff from factory farming is excluded from the Clean Water Act and the NIPTES permit process. Okay, so kind of what Megan suggested earlier, the next part would be the Clean Air Act and our climate change. And she mentioned that agriculture is a huge um, component and contributor to climate change. Um, there's been a, plenty of studies that show that the methane and, and the different um, emissions that come from factory farms is contributing to climate change, but they, it's, it's not regulated under the Clean Air Act. Um, they've even shown that it, the emissions coming from these farms fall into the criteria pollutants that can be regulated by the EPA under the Clean Air Act, and they're still not regulated. So, bringing it down to a state level, across the, every state, um, states have their own exemptions in place to make sure agriculture thrives within the state. Um, so I'm going to give some Florida examples because we're in Florida. Um, Florida has a right to farm law. Is anyone familiar with right to farm laws? I think you are, right? You're very close. So right to farm laws. Um, Basically, they, they, they seek to, well, I'm not sure, you, you can discuss more, but um, right to farm laws actually limit um, certain nuisance claims that can be brought against um, agriculture operations. So they seek to undo some of the case law and common law nuisance claims, um, like, I know not everyone's a lawyer, but the Spur case. So this, the famous Spur case that you, that you learn is that, um, the coming to the nuisance claim. You guys might know this. So if you are a factory farm and you've been in existence for a long time and someone, a development moves in next door to you, there's this case law that says, well, it's your fault you moved next to me. Well, we still, you can still make us move, but you have to pay for us to move. So in response to this, states came out with these right to farm laws and basically undid this case law. So, so that these farms can still continue to exist. Other examples in Florida. So in Florida, if you are a farm and you are operating um, normal operational practices for your type of farming, you are exempted from environmental resource permitting related to wetlands. So basically you can completely change the surface water flow on your farm as long as for a purpose of agriculture. It's very broadly written, and this allows people to just tear into wetlands in the state without any ramifications. And water management districts really have no way to, to counteract these things because they have this blanket exemption. Um, I know yesterday we, did anyone go on the tour? You went on the tour, okay. So they mentioned due to farms. If you're interested, there's a, a Duda exemption case, I can give you the site for it, but um, Duda Farms, there's a, they applied for an exemption one time, and it's a really interesting decision out of the Florida de, um, Department of Administrative Hearings, so I can get that to you. Um, the other ways that um, factory farms are exempted from laws in the state is um, building codes. So right now, the Florida legislature is considering an extension of the the exemption for building on agricultural property. So right now, you can build a non-residential building, so a barn or a shelter or something like that, a garage. Um, you can put up signs, you can put up fences, and you do not need a, on agricultural land, and you do not need a permit. So what is being considered in the house right now in Florida is to extend that to residential buildings. So now you will be able to put a house on an agricultural land without following any permits. It doesn't make any sense, but again, ag gets an exemption everywhere you go. So so when, you're, when we're operating in this kind of environment where agriculture gets an exemption everywhere you go, and they're not regulated properly, then you have to decide how, how, do you, how do you change the factory farming practices? So the answer is in the market, um, but there's some issues with that. So there's two issues with um, the agricultural market for animal products. Um, 
One, it's filled with subsidies. Um, so I'm just going to bring up a quick example for you guys. I know I'm running out of time here. And the second issue is you have consumers that are not well informed. And I don't, I actually am of the opinion that that's not exactly their fault because there is so much misinformation when a consumer enters the gro or grocery store. It's only a matter that they're confused. So, okay. So, why is, <coughs> so this is what I want you to read. So, why is the agriculture market skewed? So the USDA holds two hats for USDA markets. One, the regulators. And the second is that they are tasked with expanding economic opportunity for agriculture. So this is just a conflict of interest. You can't be a regulator and be tasked with building an agriculture economy. It's just a conflict of interest. Regulations, you know, hinder um, uh, economic advancement. So you can't have both. So that's the first issue with the marketplace, is that it's completely, it gets skewed by both subsidies and um, USDA's actions to just tweak the market where necessary. Um, and then, like I said, the, the second way, the second issue with um, correcting the, the problems in the marketplace is that um, consumers don't have a lot of information. Labeling is very arbitrary. Um, it, it's not well regulated. Um, so you can read a label and think it's perfectly good and came from a humane manner, and there's nothing actually regulated to show where that is. So I know I'm out of time. Right? Okay, so I'll turn it over to Sid, but if anyone has any other questions, um, we'll get to them afterwards, right? Okay, thanks. All right, our, our last speaker is Sid Anjbacher. Um, he, he, Sid is uh, currently general counsel to the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind, and he also practices a lot in environmental and land use law. He's an adjunct professor at the Jacksonville University Marine Science Institute Graduate School, and he, where he teaches coastal and ocean law. Um, and he's got quite a long list of awards and recognitions and experiences, and he also has an LLM from University of Arkansas in agricultural law. Um, he has over a hundred publications, and today he's going to highlight one of those that came out in the Florida Bar Journal in January 2015 called Florida Nuisance Law in Urban Agriculture, and he's also going to uh, touch on the Bill Emerson Act. So, Sid? One thing I'll guarantee, I don't think I'll have Kristen's passion. <laughs> I'm too old to have passion, except for finding a men's room. Um, and hoping my teenagers don't do anything to embarrass me too much, or more importantly, I them. Um, as you just heard, I've been practicing about 30 years. And my ag background, I'm a Florida native. I was born in Jacksonville. We actually, with the original name of Jacksonville's Calford, because that was where on the St. John's the cattle crossing existed coming down from Georgia, moved gradually farther south until we lived in South Dade County within just a few miles of where Kristen actually works in Homestead. And I would go work actually doing stoop labor uh, for my friend Alberto's father. Um, with Malanga plants south of Florida City and Homestead. Moved back up to Lake County where one of the duties back then when we actually had a substantial citrus uh, industry there was manning smudge pots during the winter. And uh, if you lived in Lake County as I did and was a student at Howie Academy and Howie uh, you help preserve the citrus industry because that's what kept the county alive. Went to University of Florida undergrad, and when I was in law school, I got to be a protector of those very special interests that 
Armstrong was talking about uh, my favorite legislation I ever drafted. It was clearly the most fascinating and local special interest I ever worked on was under the Clean Air Act of the state of Minnesota, I carved an exception for fish smokehouses uh, because, you know, we were a bunch of Norskis up there, so it's really important to have smoked fish. Uh, so I've seen both sides, and in fact, while I absolutely and personally believe that uh, in my case, water resources, which is historically, as Randy knows, been most of my career, even though as my practice has been, if it's odd, I take it. Um, I think that water resources are the principal issue associated with ag that I think is the, the, that is the Achilles heel of our nation. I think that any of you who ever looks at the Ogallala Aquifer between the Dakotas and West Texas, we'll see that the water source for 80% of the irrigated lands for agriculture in the state has dropped really, in fact, within the last decade, uh, close to 100 to 200 feet. And that is the breadbasket of America. I don't have to tell you uh, what the implications are. Uh, I think that Megan can tell you if you go to the San Joaquin and Central Valley in California, you'll see from over irrigation there uh, crusted fields salted over. That's the other breadbasket. As a native of Florida, before I get into the urban ag issue, I want to point out I have really mixed feelings about the ag issue. I want to point out that Kristen's right about some things. I think she's wrong about some technical issues, uh, but I think she's right about 90% of what she's saying technically. Um, wetlands conversion, I think, is minimized under uh, certain standards, both federal and state at ag level, but be that as it may, she's right. There are a lot of exemptions, FIFRA regulation uh, and the like. But I also have to point out, as someone who represents uh, school districts in regulation, and I feel as though I am tilting at windmills uh, against the state legislature, pulling away uh, more and more regulation of protection of mitigation for schools. Uh, I, uh, at the same time, believe that agriculture, we need to remember, is a huge resource in this state and is what kept the state afloat in between our real estate crashes of a decade ago and the hyper excited real estate market that we're re-experiencing and will cycle again and we'll be back to ag. So um, it, it's something where I really implore before I get into the local and locavore issue that you all understand um, it requires a great balancing and the reason I think we need passionate people like Kristen is because we have a legislature that essentially is deregulating and deregulating and deregulating in a wholesale manner that is extremely problematic both micro and macro when it comes to natural resources and land use. Um, I would all, I, I would just like to point out, as I discuss the local locavore issue, as you heard, a lot of my background, I, what, I got an LLM in agricultural law and I worked in agricultural economics at the University of Arkansas, and really probably in terms of success, I'm at the bottom of my class. My best friend there I really should have stayed in touch with is now the president of the University of Helsinki. You know, I could have been his valet and lived in Finland had I just stayed on the right side of history. But one thing that I've done with the University of Arkansas is work on something that has a real locavore aspect. And that is, there is a wonderful statute that was created in the Clinton administration's uh, time in office back when we actually used to pass legislation in Congress called the Bill Emerson 
and I don't know if any of you all are familiar with this act, but <clears throat> the Bill Emerson Act essentially is uh, legislation that allows for substantial protections for donation of foodstuffs, and you know, notwithstanding that, as Kristen pointed out, you have a lot of statutory protections that may or may not have a good policy implication. I think that if you look at the Emerson Act, it allows for the donation to food shelves, to Catholic charities, and similar charities throughout the country, and to do so with minimum uh, risk of liability. One major, there are two carve outs, and, and, and I've been working with the Arkansas Na National Agricultural Law Center on this pro bono for, I had hair when we started, so it's been a while. Um, the two carve outs of concern. One is, and this is very central to what you all have dealt with the last couple of days, one is that it generally protects processed foods and does not pro and, and does not generally protect fresh and fresh frozen foods. So essentially the very foods that you would want people in food deserts to have access to, um, there are no direct protections. And we've been trying to work towards that more and more with the National Ag Center. And the other thing, and it's related to the first, is uh, there is a carve out for uh, local health codes. And what you find is departments of health at the local level tend to be that much more conservative about fresh foods being donated. So essentially, again, you have a double barrel set of exemptions that or exceptions to this wonderful act that create a, an exception to essentially uh, protecting not just food deserts, but the needy and, and uh, those who are the most uh, food insecure in our society. So this has led me to deal more and more with locavore in a personal way. I'm on the board of the Clara White Mission, which is in, based in Jacksonville was founded by a woman who was a former slave. It's the oldest African-American homeless shelter in the southeastern United States. Uh, we have uh, stemmed from there to, among other things, what is called White Harvest Farms, which is an urban agriculture farm uh, that we have coordinated with DEP, Florida Department of Envir Environmental Protection, on a brownfield site. We, as part of the institutional and engineering controls, put uh, two feet of clean soil on top of the brown fields and have been growing uh, what would be considered very non-soil uh, intensive plants. And what we are trying to go to, and, I, and by the way, I'm just going to start very quickly with the war story and then tell you a couple of the macro, the big picture things, because I think you need to understand the implications of how local government, meaning well, doesn't really quite understand what it's doing when it comes to urban ag. Um, one thing we're looking at, and also a parallel group, which is based in Jacksonville, but literally is around the world and does work in Africa and does work in the Caribbean Basin called Fresh Ministries has a parallel project. And that is, um, how many of you all are familiar with either aquaponics or hydroponics? Okay, so a good number of you. Um, aquaponics is the growing of vegetables and some fruits, sometimes but generally vegetables, uh, within water with nutrients, no soil used, uh, with uh, typically fish and uh, growing as well. And that's supposed to be with aquaponics. The aquaponics side, there's an aquaponics set of zealots and there's a hydroponics set of zealots. And lucky for me, as with many of my client bases, I represent both sides. So I basically go, no, 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 when they start saying that side doesn't know what it's doing. The aquaponics side believes that 
you're doubling down and getting protein as well in a manner with the fish that you're not with the vegetables. And the vegetable people with hydroponics say we don't want fish because we don't want to be having things such as salmonella and such that are more protein-based animal bacteria getting into the vegetables. But in either event, you have the ability with dramatically less water consumption, oddly enough, because it's in the water, um, to grow vegetables in a manner that's just extraordinarily efficient. Uh, and for example, uh, Asheville Urban Farms, whom I represent, oddly enough, since I'm Jacksonville, but uh, they are noted, they've won several awards in Western Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, as you all may know, Asheville is a real foodie destination as opposed to Jacksonville, uh, but we have great barbecue. And um, Asheville Urban Farms might get a call from the restaurant Tupelo Honey, and they will say, we want arugula. They will basically say, uh, we'll give you the arugula. 40 minutes later, the arugula is delivered at the restaurant. That's the nature of aquaponics, hydroponics, when it is coordinated with a local restaurant industry. It's an amazing process. Now let me tell you what happens when you have that interface with local regulation. I go to the city of Jacksonville, who wants to work with us with hydroponics and facilitate. And we have an ag zone property at White Harvest Farms, not a typically city of Jacksonville being a Euclidean zoning jurisdiction and is used to trying to just put square pegs and round holes says we're going to zone you industry. <laughs> we're ag. There's no difference. And in fact, the only difference is we don't have soil. We have water. We can put it on pavement. We can put it on soil. We can put it wherever it needs to be. It can be on an acre. When you see urban ag articles, in this country, except a beautiful article in FAMU um, on food deserts about two years ago, uh, which was a, a wonderful, wonderful article. Um, most of it is about rust belt conversion. You always see Union Terminal in Detroit, or you see Buffalo. In Florida and in Texas and in parts of California, some of the southern tier, what you have is part of the international urban ag, where what we're reverting to is what's called southern hemisphere agriculture, markets in the location where people live, uh, food grown where people live. And what is ironic is the complete dismantling of the growth management program in the state, which is happening again in this session. It's like every two sessions, we just take another whack at what we did we followed everything Oregon did, and then once it started to work because there was one, one executive director or secretary of the State Land Planning Agency, Tom Pelham, who didn't get along with several members of the state legislature. They had an excuse to start dismantling the whole program. The irony is the one area that benefits from it is urban ag because the whole point of growth management was to prevent sprawl and to allow orderly outward development and to allow urban core to be intensely developed. And while there were some creative exceptions under the 1975 Act and the 1985 Growth Management Act, which I'm old enough to actually help do stuff on because, well, I'm old, um, we now have more freedom at the local level. As we've discussed before we got here, Andrew and I were discussing, the classic case in this state and in many states is the jurisdictions that will let you have chickens in the backyard or roosters even, and those that won't. Winter Park, last time you, not so much. Um, pardon me for whacking that. But um, the bottom line is, it, and here is again the irony, right to farm statutes that Kristen mentioned um, the best scholar in the country on the Right to Farm Acts is someone who I know well who was in the program at Arkansas two years before me, a fellow named Neil Hamilton, who's the head of the, uh, uh, of the Ag Law program at Drake University. And Neil 
writes about right to farm all the time. The interesting thing is the statutes often don't get upheld, even in the states where you don't think that they're going to have a problem. Ironically, Iowa's Supreme Court struck their first right to farm statute. But that happens from people moving to the nuisance, okay? In urban ag, in essence, the nuisance is moving back to the people. But you have to have it. I, I practice law in St. Augustine. It is becoming a destination for high-end retirees, okay? My wife is very active. She's president-elect of the Florida Council on Aging. Very active in bringing people into these sorts of urban cores for livable, aging-in-place communities, all of which is great, except as St. Augustine, as many communities have developed, literally doesn't have a grocery store anywhere near downtown. You have to go out beyond US 1. So what are you going to do if you're 65, 70, 80? You know, how are you going to live there? They don't even have they, they don't even have a market except on Saturday. I mean it's just it's impracticable. So you have to actually allow for urban ag. You have to allow for zoning. It's not just healthy, it's practical if you want to have a functioning urban core in modern society. I mean, it's really as simple as that. So I guess I lied. I get passionate. And this I'm passionate about. <laughs> and I truly just want to say, and I didn't go into any of the technical arguments about the definitions of nuisance and Windward Marina, first DCA case. Okay, I said it. Uh, but I didn't describe it. What you need to understand is that almost every comp plan every local jurisdiction, because everyone cobbles from everyone else, has something that was in the Oregon plan to begin with, and Washington State as well, which we cobbled from a little bit, principally Oregon, um, which has provision in the comp plan that says, thou shalt not create a nuisance. And in Woodward Marina, it's a, pardon me, a damnable case. I happen to agree with the dissent by uh, Judge Bob Benton there, that once you allow a nuisance standard, you basically allow an exception for almost any use that becomes locally unpopular. You can make anything sound like a nuisance. The point of that is, that being in almost every local plan, if someone is adverse to having urban ag, having the roosters, having, uh, frankly, just typical natural fertilizer in an urban area. One can argue that it's a nuisance under the circumstances, because nuisance is always a fact-specific, fact-intensive issue. So the bottom line is, notwithstanding, I think Kristen's points are good in a macro level and in a moving out to the nuisance sort of issue, if you are going to facilitate livable, walkable communities that people are actually going to live in and age in place. And by the way, last I looked, in case you haven't noticed, we're in the oldest population state in the country and we are only getting more so. You need to allow further protections of urban ag in the market, in the growing, and if you don't, then we are going to be creating further food deserts. Now, with that in mind, because it's almost lunchtime and we killed off because we were uh, basically passionate and went we on our 15 minutes each, um, my job is here, here is done. I've been a buzzkill. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you all so much. <laughs>